So it's a pleasure to be here. This is a, uh, it's a kind of a strange talk because it's going to be in three parts. I should actually turn this on. It's uh, in three parts. I want to talk a little bit about launching the Office of DEI, um, uh, lurching towards a strategy uh, uh, for the campus. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Unison. Uh, and then I also want to talk a little bit about uh, an emerging policy framework for doing learning analytics. And uh, I always find it ironic that I wind up talking about transforming education and digital education and making things modular and flipping classrooms, and yet the truth of the matter is I have a style that is, uh, 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 well, my favorite course evaluation that I ever got in the open-ended comment said, what could Professor Hilton do to improve the class? And the comment said, breathe occasionally. <laughs> um, so I have a style that's sort of like a freight train um, uh, once we get started typically. So just um, wait, wait, wave it down. We, we really, we could stop and talk. Anything moves you, stop and talk. Otherwise, I'll just wind up blasting through the slides and we'll go wherever we go at the end. Okay? Okay. So, <clears throat> uh, launching digital education and innovation. Um, if there is a great truth about the University of Michigan, it is that we are a place that seeds experiments. The phrase that I always hear when people talk about Michigan is, let a thousand flowers bloom. We, and if you think about how we approach new initiatives, new problems, often the way we approach it appropriately is say, well, let's make some funding available and let's see where people sow seeds. If I were gonna sort of say, what is it at the highest level, the challenge that DEI faces, it's how do we start to also harvest and scale from those experiments, right? It's how do we take advantage uh, of those experiments? Um, so um, the vision for DEI is uh, to redefine public residential education at a 21st century research university. So notice residential education. When people hear that I'm the vice provost for digital education, whatever, they go, oh, you're the online guy, right? Nope, I mean, online is part of it, but the reason, the focus, and this has been true of Michigan's strategy for as far back as you can look, is it is on, the, it's on, it's on what can we do, how can we use technology, how can we use online to actually transform the residential experience? So to redefine and redefine, we're at this moment in time where education in the public domain is being redefined, right? So how are we going to respond uh, to uh, a, a redefinition that if we don't, in my personal opinion, if we don't rise to it, that redefinition is gonna be exclusively focused on cost, throughput, and job placement. And that's actually not what most of us think we're doing directly, that's not why we come here every day, but that's the way the definition is going in the outside world. How do we respond to that? So re to redefine public residential education at a 21st century research university. We are a research university. We are a community bound together by a common commitment to the discovery of what's not yet known. And we do it across all disciplines. We do it in the arts. We do it in the sciences. We do it in professional schools. We are a community that's mesmerized by the questions that are around the corner, or the answers that are around the corner. So maybe we should figure out ways to make that even more infused in, in, in ours. So to redefine a public residential education at a 21st century research university through the creative use, not the pe pedestrian use, the creative use, of uh, technology and targeted experimentation with digital programs in order to enable engaged, personalized, and lifelong learning for the entire Michigan community, right? So that's the vision. And we're approaching it right now by sort of building it on these three uh, uh, pillars, which I think reflect a lot of the history of the university. So I'm gonna start from the right and move to the left. So this, this university has a long history. I've got a, show, uh, a slide that'll show this a little bit better a long and sustained history in supporting the creation of digital infrastructure, right? Goes back decades. 
Uh, we have a leadership position in learning analytics. I, when I was walking over here, I was thinking, God, it's a gorgeous day out there. Winter is coming. It's Friday. I went, there'll be five people here. So, you know, we have a commitment and an interest um, uh, in uh, learning analytics. And uh, we want that to drive curricular innovation, right? We want to go for curricular innovation in ways that are informed. Higher education has a habit uh, a long-standing tradition of making faith-based assertions about the impact of what we do. And this is an option to move a little beyond that. So this is what I like to think of as the uh, shock and awe slide, because this is actually trying to show in a single slide sort of how you take an environment that is poised towards seeding lots of experiments and trying to bring some coherence to it. So it annoys me that when you ask people who are the leaders, what are the universities that you think of when you think of leadership in digital education, digital innovation, right? That they come up with Stanford, MIT, Harvard, what was the other one? Carnegie Mellon, Penn maybe gets a little Harvard, I would actually assert, comes up because Harvard, if I said veterinarian schools, Harvard, right? It was actually a stu great study, you know, Princeton is, has one of the highest rated law programs. Princeton has no professional schools, but in reputation, they have one of the best law schools in the country, <laughs> right? <clears throat> we ought to be the third one that comes up. We ought to be the great public research university that comes up in that innovative space. And so part of what we're trying to do right off the bat is to try to take this wonderfully rich environment that's, that supports lots of experimentation and lots of innovation and project some coherence. If we just act a little, I mean, it sounds a little cynical, but if we act a little more organized than we appear, or if we appear a little more organized than we act, that's the way it would be. <laughs> if we appear a little more organized than we act, that's progress. And so it was really interesting. We were putting this uh, slide together uh, to brief uh, a subcommittee of the, of the regents on it. And there's, it's, I was just, you know, it's pleasing. We have a long history of digital infrastructure at scale. We really are one of the places that founded Internet 2. Internet 2 wouldn't have existed without the University of Michigan. But we uh, were the co-founders of Sakai. Um, we were the founding partner of Hadi Trust, right? And we are one of the founding partners of Unison, which I'll talk about here in a minute. But this is a long history, and it's a history that basically says in some areas, we need to stay in control of the ecosystem, right? Networks, digital libraries, learning, we need, right, we need to stay in charge of the ecosystem. Then on top of that, you have all of this, right, one of the great things is, all of those systems produce, uh, I heard Stephanie uh, call it, uh, digital exhaust, right? All this digital exhaust that we can start to look at to see how's the engine performing. So this history of leadership and analytics, so just uh, some examples of organized activities, including SLAM, right? And then on top of that, what you really want is curricular innovation, right? That's what you want it to drive. So how does it change? the programs and certificates that we order, how does it help flip classrooms, um, new kinds of pedagogy, um, how do we support maker spaces? So one of the things that people are off, when, when I think about digital education, it's not just online. So if you haven't wandered around the Duderstadt Center recently, you ought to go wander around the Duderstadt Center and see the, what's available to students and, and integrated with programming that happens in the disciplines that surround the Duderstadt Center. So you can't, one of the things that I love about the Duderstadt Center is you can't walk into it without immediately being hit by the fact that this is something, it turns out it's a library, but it's something that's at the intersection of engineering, music, drama, art. You just, you can't miss it. Architecture, right? It's at the epicenter of it. And part of what it does is it creates, it provides access to digital tools to students and faculty that they wouldn't otherwise have access to. And just a quick plug for library thinking, you know, if you think about in the analog world, the reason why libraries 
have amazing collections of books was because in the analog world, what your collection, the, the, the books that comprised your collection determined the scholarship that you could do. And increasingly, you have to start thinking about technology and software in that space too. So, okay, so uh, the sort of elevator pitch for this sort of thing is who? Well, it's U of M residential community and beyond. Uh, why? To redefine public residential education at a 21st century research university in order to enable engaged, personalized, and lifelong learning, right? How? Curricular innovation, learning analytics, digital infrastructure at scale. And then the what of it, which I'm going to talk about here in a minute, is so, so how do we start to organize activity under, supporting activity under it? How, if you want to do all that other stuff, what do you need to help make it happen? So this is the way we think about DEI. And James is going to jump in any time if I uh, start to go wrong or if he gets a phone call. Um, so this is the way we think about it. It's a, it's a set of services and a set of resources. It's mostly a collaborative hub. Mostly what DEI is about is a collaborative hub, in my view. It's about providing, right? I, I have a question I need to go, I need to know. I want to change my class. I want to... I want to get more involved in analytics. I want to think about modularizing things. How would I do it? One of the things that we think about as DEI is sort of a one-stop shop to point you in the right directions. Not to necessarily provision those resources. This is not, right, this is not, the goal here is not to go out and have 3,000 employees all doing this kind of stuff, right? The goal is for DEI to be plugged in, aware of all of the resources that are on around uh, campus, point people to those resources, and fill in the gaps, the cracks in between where we need it. So these are sort of what we've identified so far. So some venture fund, which is really aimed at this question of how do we harvest innovation and transform residential learning. So yes, seeding, but equally, maybe even more importantly, how do we get, get experiments that start to succeed on a path to scale? Because often what you do in a one-off experiment isn't sustainable, not scalable. DEI is looking at that. I mean, that, that's one of the core things that we think we're uh, going to try to help solve. Consulting services. How do we frame, position, enable, accelerate, prototype, and guide? Develop and partner. Develop and partner with schools, with other units on campus, with faculty, right, with graduate students, with researchers. Um, we have a lab, uh, which is um, mostly right now focused on video production, right? We have a suite of video studios and expertise around that. Uh, and one of the things that we're in the question about is how do you scale, the, the, um, uh, one of the things that you want to make sure is that when you scale that, you scale that with the um, a phrase we like to think of is appropriate redundancy, right? It's not this, oh, there must be only one and one and only one, but we also don't want 50 million um, reproductions. Um, and then use lab is part of DEI. Uh, how do we uh, use learning analytics in advanced scholarship? Uh, and then digital innovation greenhouse, uh, brand new, really this question of how do you grow digital engagement innovations that enable personalization at, at, at scale, right? So providing, we, uh, uh, we, 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 you might think of that as, well, the digital greenhouse. Oh, you're the person who came up with digital greenhouse. So if there are questions, I'm going to refer them to you. But it's, it's, it's like a pipeline, only it's greener. <laughs> OK? OK, so organic pipeline. OK, so questions about that, because we're about to go to Unison. Observations, thoughts, anything. OK, we're going to go to Unison then. So yep. Talk about it as a hub. Mm -hmm. How will it provide the opportunity for people to be together? What do you think about it? Much like the, uh, much like the university itself, it's a, it's a distributed hub. <laughs> it, has a, it has two primary physical locations. So the lab is on uh, Washington Street, just head, head towards downtown from North Quad, and you'll, you'll, uh, uh, you'll hit it. Uh, what's the address? Is it 500? 500 Washington. Uh, and then 
there's also, uh, and, and that is, uh, in fact, uh, James was telling me this morning that there were four simultaneous activities going on in there. So it, it is video studios, but it's also meant to be collaborative space. It's meant to be space where, you know, we, we hope to cultivate uh, uh, the, the notion that this is where you want to come and talk about new wild ideas, right? And then we'll try to help you figure out where to go, right? Um, and then there's also uh, space on the eighth floor of Hatcher. Uh, if you go all the way up, so go up to the second floor, go to the elevators, go to the top, come out of the elevators and go towards the uh, west end of the building. And uh, we have some collaborative space there and uh, three or four offices. So we're a distributed hub. Uh, and... Uh, You know, at the, at the highest level, what the goal of DEI is, is to continually provoke this question about what should we be, how do we, how do we adapt, how do we change, how do we learn from the experiments around mostly teaching and learning. But in my view, the, you, you know, we're a research university. It's, it's, it's hard to separate out teaching and research. And in fact, my own personal belief is the more deeply we could integrate those things, the more differentiated and better we'll be. Yep. James, just to follow up on that, for the, uh, for the College of Engineering's uh, Center of Entrepreneurship, we're also offering off-campus yep. uh, incubator space for those students and faculty who would like to think about how to scale this next growing commercial. So yep. That's, I think, Right, and so actually I would say the other thing that I think about in, in Hub, like what do we aspire to do? Um, uh, I can't tell you the number of conversations that we have trying to distill down to what are the, the way I think about it is what are the sweet spots of all these different resources around campus, right? So what, what's, the re what's the sweet spot there of, you know, if it's innovation potentially towards uh, commercialization? What's the sweet spot of learning and teaching in the library? What's the sweet spot of teaching and learning in ITS? What's the sweet spot of CRLT? What's the sweet spot of many schools and colleges have their own offices with a variety of names or individuals pointed at this? Uh, we're trying to become, again, not the empire, but the network that connects those. Right? A sort of single point where you come in. Because one of the things that's vital for DEI if we're going to be successful is, um, so we've been in this era of sort of experimentation. Um, the minute you start to say, how are we going to scale it? And you look at how this university is organized and how the budget flows and everything else. If you don't do this in partnership with the schools and colleges, if you don't, so just a free resource a free resource doesn't, in the long run, have the, it has the ability to ignite things. It doesn't have the ability to sustain things. So it's like deep in, it's got to be deep in the DNA of DEI that is it about partnering and collaborating. It cannot be um, about uh, we're going to be the place that, you know, replaces everybody else. It, it, we we want to be the place that helps people find the path and that leverages the resources and has an awareness to be uh, able to help guide this question about where do you get to optimal redundancy. Well, that makes sense? Yep. So at what level of personalization that you talk about in the innovation, is that the same level, like Google is looking at every action that you do online and try to um, so, yeah, so the question is, is that, so what, at what level of personalization are you thinking about? That's actually going to be relevant, especially when we get to the third part where we talk about data analytics and data management policies and all those kinds of things. Um, what I would say right now is that everything that you see there is, a, is more of a directional statement than, in, than, so I don't know more than we do now, right? It's a directional statement. Okay. Okay, now we're going to go to Unison. And it's Unison, like Zinfandel, not Unison, like, even though Unison sort of sounds like a sleeping aid. Um, so, 
not, not strong on branding. Um, so uh, I'll just, I'm going to give you a quick pitch for why Unison and then tell you um, sort of a little bit about where we are. And I'm going to try to convince you that, in fact, there's a holy grail in here somewhere that we're chasing. So Unison is a university member-owned service, like Internet2 is a university member-owned service uh, aimed at controlling the emerging digital ecosystem. So <clears throat> why do we need Unison? So here's the way I think about teaching and learning. Um, uh, if you, and this is not in a digital world. This is in an analog world. This is everything, right? If you think about what we're engaged in, we uh, take content. And we, we and our students do things with that content. So when I first started teaching intro psych, one of my colleagues said, oh my god, how can you teach intro psych? Um, uh, you, there's way too much stuff to cover. Plus, I mean, there are entire areas of psychology that like, I don't know really much about. And I said, well, two things. First, on the, there's areas you don't know anything about. And you only have to stay two weeks ahead of the students, so it's OK. You have a habit of thinking about it, right? You, you, you think about it differently. You have an informed guide of it. But on the too much, that was the feature, not the bug for me, because it became incredibly clear that for me, content was fodder. So nothing made it into intro psych that I didn't think was both important and interesting, right? And like, if you can't engage around that, you're just not trying. So, um, but it drove home to me that it's content is fodder for the most part, right? And if I ever had any doubt of it, when I used to long ago teach intro psych, the one truth, right, because we, we have universities are sort of built around this implicit, deeply ingrained premise that the first thing you have to do is collect a bunch of information. You've got to have a bunch of facts. Uh, that's why libraries exist. That's why universities originally existed, bring together, right? And on that, you can do things with it. But first, you get the information. In. And a lot of models of introductory courses are just cram a bunch of information. The gate you've got to get through is this one. Right? And then you can go do stuff anyway. It's fodder. Right? Oh, so intro psych, right? the one truth that I could count on, right? the one truth that they could take home and it would be true until the day they died was you're born with four billion neurons and it's downhill from there. Damn it, turns out that's not. I mean, it's good that's not true, but it's not true. Right? So I'm going to have to relearn all that stuff. OK, so you do stuff with it. You give a lecture on it. You organize a discussion on it. You assign an essay. You say, compare and contrast. You create problem sets. You have people interact with content. And out of that, you get outcomes. Right? Some of those outcomes are really easy to measure. How many problems did you get right on the test? Some of them are a little harder. Have we changed your habit of thinking? Right, if you think about what disciplines are about, they're really about habits of thinking, right? And some of them are really hard, the ones we really care about. Did we change the quality of your life? Right? Because at the end of the day, that's what we're aiming for. So in the analog world, all that happens. It's just really hard to tra track, really hard to track. So if you want to study this in the analog world, you wind up having to get huge grants, you videotape things, you content analyze things, you, it's, it's hard. And one of the things that's changed is now in the digital world, all that's mediated by all of, even if you're deeply engaged in face-to-face -face education, and that's what you're going to do from here on out, increasingly a lot of that is being mediated by digital tools. And there are two things about that that are, and, and that happens against the context of a whole bunch of other data, right? So they spit out data just as a process of operating. And it happens against the context of a bunch of other data that we collect in the university, but currently mostly keep siloed, right? Which we'll get to in part three of the talk. So um, one is you can, now, you can now start, you can look at that with a little di at a different scale, different level of analysis, different everything, right? The second thing that it does is it starts to say, whoa, and it's hard to separate out in the digital world the applications from the content. It doesn't break cleanly, and I'll give you an example of that here in a second. So increasingly, what that all says is that digital ecosystems 
our infrastructure, more like common gauge rails. We want these things to talk to each other. We want to be able to reuse content. We want data to flow with the appropriate controls around privacy. But we want that to happen. We have a vested interest in making that happen. So there, that we need common gauge rails. And it's infrastructure. It's not the thing that differentiates an institution. So in the IT business, my previous slide, in the IT business, right, one of the things that was really frustrating is IT is often sold, right? Enterprise business systems are sold because they're going to give you insight into your customers and they're going to give you competitive advantage. Well, that's not where our competitive advantage comes from. Our competitive advantage comes from the faculty, staff, students who come here and what they do with the information that's available. Not whether we have the brightest, shiniest bauble with the latest new feature, right? Which doesn't mean that those things don't disrupt and inform, but I, I have, I've said previously, I, f I feel like um, when it comes to technology often, we're like crows. We, we're looking for the bright, shiny object and we get nabbed by it. And in the long run, that's a really frustrating place. To, it's a guaranteed frustrating place to be because all of these companies are in competition with each other. All of them are most, they are, they are biased towards proprietary systems and the brightest, shiniest bauble is going to be on whoever has the latest release cycle. So buy it now, six months from now, you're going to be frustrated that there's something else out there that you just got to have. Anybody picking up their iPhone 6 today out of curiosity? Anyway, so, okay, so uh, we should think about them as infrastructure, right? We should think about them as infrastructure. And the challenge is who's going to control this emerging digital ecosystem? So Pearson, who's in the content business, but trying to figure out how long the content business is going to pay, will now give you a learning management system if you adopt their books. I'm sure that that's only nobly motivated. <laughs> right? Desire to learn uh, a, uh, a learning management system uh, came to my office uh, and, and uh, presented their roadmap on my whiteboard. And uh, it's, an impressive, it's an impressive roadmap. Uh, they're going to have a learning analytics engine. They're going to have a content repository. All that stuff's going to be great, except what I <coughs> noticed was the way they drew it. They drew the content repository and the learning analytics module in the center of everything, surrounded by what appeared to me to be the fortress of the learning management system. Right? We have a vested interest in making sure, like, who should control that? Well, we should. And I, I actually want to use um, Coursera uh, and uh, uh, the, our, our partnership with Coursera to sort of demonstrate how thorny this ecosystem is. So the contract we have with Coursera, that everybody has with Coursera, is beautifully straightforward, written by non-lawyers, at least the first draft. And you can read it. It's, it's, it's great. And, it, and it's got all the things that you want. It says that um, we agree that we're going to partner together, and we're going to play well together, and you're going to provide some content, and we're going to provide some tools, and you're going to provide some faculty, and we're going to provide some technology. And if we ever part ways, you own what you own, and we have no claims on it. And we own what we own, and, and you have no claims on it. I mean, that's what you want in an experiment, right? Except the minute you start working in this digital ecosystem, you realize that you can't actually separate out cleanly content from everything else. So who in a Coursera or an edX, who in that class, that course, who, who has rights to the comments generated by users? Right? Who has crowdsourced translations? Who owns those? Right? It just gets increasingly hard to separate that out. So Unison says, we actually want to own, we want to control, not own, we want to control the ecosystem, and we want to bias it towards loose coupling. Right? Not this tight integration where 
It works all great as long as you're in one system, but the minute you try to switch to something else or talk to something else, it doesn't work. So Unison is about that. So interunison, a university member-owned service aimed at controlling the emerging digital ecosystem that reflects three principles. The first principle is that digital content, software platforms, and data, data analytics, uh, which we're going to call services, right, um, are essential and strategic capabilities that enable universities' core mission in education. Not the version of analytics that you have, not the version of the service that you have, but that you have those things is the strategic capability. Um, we have a vested interest in staying in control of our data, our students, our content, and our reputation and brand. Right? Um, you can join, well, um, directing these integrated capabilities as an academy-owned set of loosely coupled service is an important means to protect universities' interests over time, primarily because ownership affords control. Right? So it's basically saying in the in the ecosystem that links content, applications, and outcomes, we have the same kind of interest that we had in high performance networking, right? And that model, Internet2, a university consortium that went out and acquired a, a high performance network, has now migrated it through four versions. Uh, it is the biggest, baddest research network on the planet right now. Um, it's incredibly affordable. Uh, in two ways. One, absent Internet 2, we would not be able to have access to 100 gig connections. Just wouldn't have them. And if you could have them, it would cost m more than all of our technology budget, almost certainly. So uh, it, it's really interesting economics. So uh, they've, uh, so I, I actually hold uh, Internet 2 up as the most successful higher ed collaboration certainly of modern times. Um, and so we want to try to do the same thing in this space. So the Unison strategy um, is to approach technology platform decisions as strategic decisions, not just feature set comparisons, not just looking at, say, which has the shiniest new feature. Approach control of the ecosystem like we approach control of the network ecosystem. Leverage the lessons and successes we've had from Internet 2, right? around governance models, around pricing models, everything. Um, favor, meaning demand, um, loosely coupled ecosystems. Right? Take advantage of scale and collaboration. Aggregate our demand and aggregate our requirements. Does mean we have to say, well, you know, we're kind of more like you than not like you, which is always a challenge in higher ed, but do that when it comes to the infrastructure part. Right? Acquire services and technology on favorable terms. Right? Build only where you must. Invest development in pushing standards and creating reference implementations. Right? So this is, a, this is an attempt to disrupt the market. This is not a software project. Right? Um, Unison is about synchronizing capital and demands, not about community development. With me? OK. So that's the high level. That's why Unison. So currently, four institutions have committed a uh, million dollars each to support the creation of Unison. We're in active conversations with more. I expect us, I expect us by Christmas to have uh, eight to ten um, universities that are equally committed and have also ponied up a million dollars each. Uh, and that's to make that's to that's to do all the work that I just said. And then on top of that, Unison goes out and contracts for services, which we pay additionally for. Just like with Internet 2, we pay an Internet 2 membership fee, right? And we pay a network fee. The network fee actually pays for the service. The membership fee pays for all of the work that Internet 2 does to put that ecosystem together, right? So, um, uh, and like I said, I'm, I'm actually kind of hopeful that when Educause hits, we'll have some more, but we'll, we'll see. It's... Uh, Every universe, one of the challenges we have is every university legal departments wants to rewrite all of the terms. And that's where we are with a number of institutions right now. We have conceptual buy-in, they have the money, it's everywhere through the system, but we don't have signatures yet. And I can't tell you who they are. Yes, Matt. So what, what is really the level of the institutions that are chipping in? 
That's to create the capability of Unison to go out, identify needs, work with the communities to identify needs, and then contract for services. It's to develop, um, you'll see in a minute what the loose coupling, it's to develop reference implementations of open standards to connect things. So there's an actual organization, organization. Yeah, we have a CEO and is, 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 is uh, well, and I hope we're going to have a, uh, uh, learning, uh, uh, a learning analytics art, I don't know what the title is going to be, but a learning analytics architect and a content uh, architect, because that's what most of the work is next. And I, I think that'll get clearer with these slides. So the first thing that we did with Unison was we went out and cut a deal with Canvas for Canvas to be the learning management system. Canvas is uh, 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 is a hosted, single-instance, multi-tenant uh, learning management system. Uh, it's, it is Unison's first service. It's not synonymous with Unison. It's just the first service that's being rolled out. But right now, it's the, one, it's, it's the first one you have to pick, right? The learning management system really does sit at the center of this right now. So it's the first service. Well, what was attractive about Canvas? Because remember, Canvas was on that slide that I said, Ooh, how do you make sure you stay in control of the ecosystem when there are all these places that might want to do it? Well, first, Canvas is largely open source. It's about 90% open source. The part that's not open source is the secret sauce that lets you run multiple, inst multiple uh, single instance, multiple, mul whatever. Multiple campuses in a single instance, right? It's the cloud, it's the cloud part of it that's not, uh, that's not open source. So you could go out today and pick up the, 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 the code tarball for uh, Canvas and run it locally. Um, what you can't do with their open source is run multiple institutions on a single hosted instance, right? Um, so first, they're largely open source. They built the company with that from the beginning. So they've been pointed from the beginning with, we're gonna make money by providing really excellent service on top of open source software, right? Um, so uh, that's attractive. They're directionally pointed in a similar way to us. Um, uh, what wasn't open source, they will provide source code for us in the event that we part ways. So it's also the case that the leadership there right now is very aligned with our interests. They see the world and they see Unison's play as fitting in with the way they want the world to go, or at least that's what they tell us, and that's what all the uh, negotiations have done. But we negotiated it under the assumption that in five years we will hate each other's guts. because they're going to change leadership, and that's the way you have to approach these things. So we, uh, we, we did a contract which we think protects us in the event that their interests and our interests start to diverge. Um, uh, uh, Canvas Instructure is aggressively pu pushing standard-based approaches to connecting tools. So they've probably done more in the LTI space, the standard space, than anybody else. They're the one place right now where you can go get, if you, there's an LTI-enabled application that you want to plug into Canvas, they have a store that lets you go grab that code and do it. Um, uh, currently, it's the best-in-class LMS, judging by adoption rates. They're just killing uh, in the adoptions. What time is it? I got to pick this up. I bet. Um, okay, but so perfect. I'm supposed to be done in ten minutes. Here we go. Okay, <laughs> ready? Here comes the freight train. Okay, so uh, so the LMS is just one part. We're in pilot mode right now. Um, in the fall, uh, there are about 20 pilots that are going on, and the, and, uh, the main uh, goal of those pilots actually is to figure out if there are deal breakers. If there are deal breakers, we don't adopt, we don't adopt Canvas. By the end of the fall, we should know whether or not there are deal breakers, and there'll be another set of more extended pilots in the winter, which are more about, okay, if we're gonna make this trans, if we're gonna make this transformation, right, this transition, What's the right pace, right? How, mu how, how quickly would we move to it? How hard is it? How many tools are available to migrate comment content out of C tools into this, right? So stay tuned. Um, people sometimes ask, is, is it a done deal? Well, really, you're, come on. Really, you're telling me we're going to go to Canvas no matter what. And I am not saying that. I, I really mean, seriously, the fall is about figuring out if there are deal breakers. The winter is figuring out about the pace. 
I won't deny that for all the reasons that I just laid out about why we think Unison was a good strategy and why Unison picked Canvas, I think the table's tilted pretty heavily, but it's tilted for those reasons. And again, we're going to see whether or not they're a deal breaker. Okay, but the LMS is just one part of it. Uh, what you really want to be able to do is to connect the LMS to content on one end. Uh, so this is the Unison roadmap. We're, we're, uh, Unison, what, a lot of what the investment from the institutions is going to be in Unison services is in developing a content relay and on the other end an analytics relay, which are really about concentrating on reference implementations of open standards-based APIs to connect content repositories on one end and data, uh, to, uh, data analytic tools on the other to the data that gets spit out. So we hope to connect uh, in the spring of 2015 to uh, uh, a variety of, uh, I would say, academic repositories. Uh, by the fall, so a year from now, uh, you'll see, we'll see more extensive connections with uh, publishers and, uh, uh, and if you're gonna connect repositories, you actually have to have an e-commerce engine and all that kind of stuff in there. And then on the other side, analytic sources and tools, we need a Unison, we, we're conceptualizing it as a Unison analytics relay that will connect uh, to a, a variety of data sources. And it's, again, the idea is you want the content to be able to be exportable reuse from uh, the LMS. You want the data to be similarly positioned. With me? Now we're gonna do a really quick quick tour. I'm not going to get to the learning analytics policy stuff. Um, but I'm going to give you a really quick tour. So this is the really nerdy part of my life. I ask you to indulge. I'm trying to find ways to make this. I believe so. The great thing about anal the analog world in academics is we have had centuries to figure out the workflows associated with text. And in fact, it's so deeply ingrained that as a faculty member pursuing tenure, I never actually had to think about that. All I had to think about was come up with the ideas, write the research proposal, get it funded, get the research done in collaboration with my students, write it up, figure out which journal it might go to, and get it accepted. All of which are exactly the same things I would think about if you said, what do you need to do to get tenure? Same thing, right? And I don't have to worry about how does it get distributed. I don't worry about whether it's going to get collected. I don't have to worry about how, whether, it's going to be, whether anybody's going to be able to find it 20 years from now. And the problem is in the digital world, all that's gotten blown up. I basically go, the problem with the digital world is I have to think both too much and too little. Too much, because I didn't have to think about any of that in the analog world. Too little, because if I think about it very long, my head's going to start to hurt, and I'm going to say, I don't know, I'm going to go to Best Buy, I'm going to buy another hard drive, and I'm going to hope it works. Right? I'm going to back it up under my desk or something, and I'll hope that I figure out how to solve everything else later. Right? Because mostly as a researcher, my attention is moving to whatever the next problem is, not how do I deal with this stuff. Right? So... Digital workflows, increasingly, right, these same applications, so the learning management system for sure, but you could substitute learning management system with a data management system if we had one of those things, right? Uh, and it's all about routing, so let me just give you examples. So I want students to have access to an e-text from a publisher. Well, it'd be really great if we could pull content from the publisher directly into the LMS through the content relay. I want to deposit the simulation I built in Merlot. Like right now, if you wanted to deposit, Merlot is, an, is a peer-reviewed open education resource repository. If I said, go deposit something in Merlot right now, I would have to do some research, right? I couldn't figure it out. Well, we have the opportunity to start doing that. And also to, you know, uh, counting on network effects, once you have these kind of workflows in, that you'll get some aggregation, which would be a good thing for the world. We don't need 150,000 open educational repositories. We need the content in them to be findable, right? And, and, and independent of where you start to search. Okay, I want 
students to use a simulation that's in Merlot. Well, I ought to be able to go right out and pull it, pull it into the LMS, right? Keeping it loosely coupled. I want to release a study under a Creative Commons license. So a study guide. So I've written something that looks and smells like text. It just happens to be digital. Where should I stick it? Well, gosh, Hadi Trust is a digital library with 80 institutions aimed at curating digital text for the forever, right? And it's on a sustainable model right now. Um, it doesn't accept deposits. That's a little technicality, but, but it could. <laughs> Well, we, we, we are, we're part of Hadi. We, we're in these, actually, we're in these conversations. This is critical for libraries to figure this stuff out, right? So they could accept it. If they accepted deposits, if they had the Hadi curated collected wing and the user deposit wing, that'd be great, right? Because then it's just like in the analog world, I don't have to think about it after it's gone. It's taken care of. Future generations will be able to do it. You know, if we don't solve this problem, the odds that digitally created stuff, which is pretty much everything right now, will be accessible in anything close to the original form to our intellectual grandchildren is really slim. I say 50-50. Most of the librarians I talk to say you're way too optimistic. Um, okay, uh, or suppose I want to deposit my thesis in the institutional repository. Again, wouldn't it be great if the tools that I use every day are the ones that I use to deposit that stuff as opposed to having to go learn another tool? So the LMS, right, these applications that we have a finite number of that are pretty ubiquitous in, in terms of use across campus, let's build the workflows into that and write it in. Or I want to deposit data in a data repository for preservation. So Chronopolis is sitting out at UC San Diego, and they basically say, come bring us your data, whatever format you want, we'll store it dark for pretty much as long as you want. So maybe that's, maybe some data should be routed there. As a fact, the, part of what I like about this is it provides an opportunity for us to, in natural language, ask people questions. What have you got? What do you want to do with it? Who should have access to it? And if you ask those questions, you actually get a metadata that can go a long ways towards rationalizing all of this. Right? And then on the analytics side, it's the same thing, just the other way. So I need to be able to get data out to feed eCoach or Gradecraft or the Unison data warehouse. So Unison is going to be hosted single instance, single instance multi-tenant. I finally remembered that word. Single instance multi-tenant. Whether we choose to do this or not is a separate question, but the data warehouse possibilities. So Internet2 started with 30 institutions. It now has 200, actually has 600 total members. Imagine what would happen, just if you thought 30, imagine what would be possible if you had 30 institutions with a shared data warehouse in terms of the kinds of questions that you could ask, especially on very small populations. Right? So you that question about how much personalization could you get, well, helped potentially by this. And my personal favorite is um, Unison also is, unlike Coursera and edX, which confounds a club, who's in it, with a platform, Unison is about the platform. You can build clubs on top of it. So maybe the CIC says, actually, what we're really interested in is the CIC shared data warehouse, and we want fed by that. And I'm going to stop there. Does this, I got to ask though, does this come close to making sense? Yes. Okay. Too many slides to take it there. So assuming it makes sense, what questions do you have? See, this is what I always worry about. Oh yeah, it makes sense. Yep. It makes total sense. Um, selfishly, what I'm thinking about as a second year faculty member, how do I make my where are the resources I can go to see what other people have been doing and using these things? I love the big picture, but I'm just worried about my little bit. Now. Are you waving your hand for that? Yeah, that, that might have almost been a planted question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if you're trying to think, okay, this is pretty exciting, not quite sure how my work attaches to it yet. If you're an instructor, we actually have an opportunity for you to start to attach your work to parts of this in particular. The Gradecraft box over there, which 
which is one of the early DEI investment projects as we try to think about taking an idea and growing it so that it can serve more of campus more effectively. Um, we are going to look for 15 or 20 instructors who are looking to experiment with, in this case, gameful or gamified instruction. Um, that is uh, a way of creating a more engaging learning environment and supported by technology. Mika Labakmati and I have spoken in the past in this forum about it and at the Embracing Scholarship Conference for a few years. So look for an email, I think coming from Rachel, um, that we'll be inviting people to express their interest in participating in a learning group that we want to have convened in November for one, maybe two meetings to talk about theory, practice, application. We'll be asking instructors to bring your syllabi with you to help us help you convert it into a gameful or gamified syllabus. Two direct benefits to people who want to do this. One, you'll get personal consultation on your syllabus from an engagement and assessment perspective. Two, you may get to actually use Gradecraft in your class in the winter term to support gameful or gamified teaching. So I'm hoping there are people in this room that are interested in that. We're going to send the email to everyone who has signed up for the SLAM series and also to other interested parties around campus. And feel free to share it with your faculty if you are here representing a unit. And, and other places, so DEI would be an obvious place to go. CRLT would be a place to go. Again, CRLT, the library, learning and teaching, ITS, teaching and learning, we're all in pretty close contact around this. Um, right? Yep. I, I think this is more of a comment. There may, there may be a question very in here, too. Um, I'm an electrical engineer. I can't understand anything to do with computers. Um, and, um, I'm a social I'm, psychologist. I'm, I'm, I'm going to comment and ask sort of the same. So I'm a faculty member, a greater than his second year, um, uh, much, much greater than, you know, like the city here in the state. Um, that, uh, so, so what's in it for me? But the comment is, um, it, it, MIT has, in my opinion, vastly overgrabbed reputation uh, in this whole area because they toss all this stuff out on the on the open coursework stuff. Um, and you know, I'm in my alone, so I can I you know, I'm proud of it and blah blah blah. But I'm watching my old professors, some of them are older than Methuselah now, it's badly produced stuff, and they've made an enormous amplification of the, uh, of their reputation as a result of that. Me as an individual faculty member here to sort of even try something similar. But you know, Gee, I've got a good course. I digitally record it. Let's plop it up there. There are just no mechanisms to, to or no easy mechanisms for that. Coursera is too much overhead for most of us to mess with. So I would love to see some way that I can say, okay, I'm going to put 215 up there um, and, and have it have it in, in a place where it can be found, identified with the University of Michigan, um, and uh, you know, in, in some sense, it's a little bit me too. But, but it's better to be me too than non-existent. So that's my, my comment for what, whatever's worth. Yeah, so just a couple of reactions to that. Uh, so first, yeah, uh, uh, um, better to be me too than nothing. I, I want to aspire a little higher than that. Um, uh, I think that one of the things that we have been doing is we've been approached. So when MIT, I was here long ago in that other titled position, when MIT announced the Open Courseware Initiative, and I had actually spent a year working for the provost on intellectual property around all kinds of things, and when they announced that initiative, this can, my, I laughed. When they said, oh, they were going to put $100 million and put the MIT curriculum online, I laughed and I said, never happened, stupid move, can't believe they're doing that for two reasons. One, the intellectual property challenges around it, because most of what we use in our classes, we don't actually own. Right? It's that fodder we do. So I went $100 million, not nearly enough to clear the permissions for that. Um, second, I went, plus, it's going to, in a sort of bare naked way, make it clear that you pay MIT for the degree, not for the curriculum. And I thought, that's just going to be, that's just not going to play well. And oh my god, I was so wrong on both fronts. Because what they did was they released the stuff that they could release. They released it without uh, very high production values in a lot of cases, and then started working their way back. They made a huge splash 
and they globally, especially in places like India, they, they became engineering because of that brand. So, you know, it was a, so I missed that one. Um, uh, gives you a lot of confidence for the next one. But, um, but I think that part of what Michigan is, so the first thing is Michigan really is positioning. It is about, it is about the residential education and then what we do on top of that to push brand and things. And I think our bias is to want it to be more, not, not painfully let's study it until the paint dries, but higher production values, higher, uh, higher quality uh, aiming out and, and, and to build it around that. But it's really rapidly moving. I'm going to advocate both volume, you know, volume, let's get more out there, and, and lower barriers for faculty to do it. Right. So we would love to talk with people who have a variety of production desires and personal investment desires to see if we can find some paths. It's easy for us to, uh, to take on the people who say, um, I, you got me heart, mind, body, and soul. If we're going to scale it, though, we have to get people who say, look, this is... I care about this, but it's not, it's not the thing that's going to drive me every day. Yep? So from the perspective of transforming, redefining, innovating, residential education as a research institution, looking at it from the perspective of Michigan, how does that look like in terms of the ecosystem? It's really fascinating and, and sort of overview. But then what else has to change? Oh. I mean, what has to change physically on campus? What has to change in terms of how people think about this? Well, in what? I mean, so, yeah, so I think this is where the conversation gets fun, and that's actually where I, I hope that's what, what the conversation is about moving forward, as opposed to do we like Canvas better than we like C-Tools, right? Would, I mean, right? Because, I, I mean, I think about speculating broadly, I think about all kinds of things. So. Part of the reason why I went down this path is when I used to teach intro psych, I would come home and I would say to my wife, I feel like I am the fastest telegraph operator on the planet. And this can't be the best use of time. So one of the ways that I think about it, I don't look so much at threat, right? Like people are talking about all this disruption that's coming. I, I hear that. But the way I look at it is we have this gift. We have these gifts which are around synchrony, which are around physical presence, which are around um, objects and which are around this community that's bound together by this common commitment. So how do we make the best use of those gifts in the residential program? And maybe it means, and this is terrifying, maybe it means we deliver introductory classes, at least those that still operate on a model that is mostly master a set of information and basic skills. Maybe we should think about a different way of how we deliver those so if I hadn't gone down this path, what I was going to do was I was going to record my lectures. This was 15 years ago. I was going to record my lectures, and then I was going to step into a classroom with 500 people and say, now we're in the biz. How are we going to, right? That's homework, right? It would have been horrible because it would have been one hour and they would have hated it, but, right? Now what are we going to do face to face? How do we, so I think we've got to ask questions like also, so that's one, another sort of speculating broadly, I find it interesting that at least within the sciences and social sciences, we view scholarship as a team sport with lots of different roles, all valued. So, and, and like in, you, in, in physics, you have theoretical physicists, you have experimental physicists, you have instrument people, right? And, and, and we know it takes that team. When I look at the digital ecosystem, Teaching is going to get more and more that way, even if what you're doing is residential. Now, the humanities, they're already flipped. I mean, it is kind of amusing to say, we should go to a flipped curriculum. Well, a seminar with 15 people is pretty flipped, right? I don't know how you'd, like, I don't know how you'd flip that. But a lot of it isn't. But even in those, so I, when I taught intro psych, I went, and I'll make this, I'll be done. When, <laughs> When I taught intro psych, one of the things that I found really frustrating was I was coming into it new. I was into a rotation of other people who also taught it. The model at the time was you taught all the big sections. One instructor taught all the big sections. I had 25 or 30 GSIs for the course. 
And what I was struck by was every instructor picks a different textbook, which mostly, right, which drives textbook costs for students. But what I was mostly struck by was it's this busy work for graduate students to try to figure out, okay, where did that stuff that was in that chapter in that book appear here? Because after the second edition, arguably the second edition is usually the best in, in intro psych textbooks, after the second edition, it's mostly organizational changes to drive new editions. And I went, you know, I can teach from any of the top, there were 130 textbooks in intro psych at that time. I went, pick any of the top 20 and I'll teach from them. Can I, so I went to the other instructors in the department and said, can we just pick a common textbook so that we quit killing semester to semester the graduate students? Nope. <laughs> nope. Academic freedom, it's my class. I think that's a challenge. I mean, I think how we start to think about a team approach, and I, I don't mean that in a I don't mean that in a flip way. I mean in a deeply collaborative way, it seems to me, teaching in this space gets more and more that way. And we tend to approach it from a governance perspective that says, oh, I'm the instructor of record, it's my domain, right? And I think that's a challenge. So on that note, let's, thank you.